Sunday of Lent, and on this Sunday, we have the opportunity to welcome our mission partners to come and share with us a little bit about what they are doing, and a very little bit, which is, you know, kind of compressed as we have all of them kind of squeezed in on this day. And to be able to launch this time appropriately and effectively, I want to be able to invite Jackie up front first as uh, she represents one of those missions that we know very dearly to our hearts, North Hills Community Outreach. All our food that you bring in and dump into those baskets over there and any grocery bags you bring and all the other things that we do to help out North Hills Community Outreach. It's an amazing ministry, and you're about to get on a journey here with us. We're going to try a whole new format where we're going to go five at a time and then sing and break it up a little bit. So buckle in, enjoy the time. And All right. Jackie, it's great to have you here with us, and I appreciate the time that we have to share. Thank you. <clears throat> Again, my name is Jackie Boggs. I'm from North Hills Community mm-hmm. Outreach. I started with the outreach 10 years ago as a volunteer tax preparer, um, and it's been a wonderful journey. Uh, NHCO has been around for over 35 years, addressing the needs of those experiencing hardship, crisis, and poverty. And we do that first by helping our families meet their basic needs with food, rental assistance, utilities, transportation. 
then we can help our clients move towards stability when they're ready with case management, legal assistance, employment services, free tax prep. Um, and then we have programs specifically for our older adults, helping them live independently. And those are our in-service of seniors and our free rides for senior shuttles. We have provided 25,000 services to 3,363 individuals last fiscal year, and we cannot do it without our partners and without our volunteers. Three ways that you can get involved with NHCO right now is help us collect personal care items that are distributed to our families that visit our food pantries. Uh, we need volunteers to help us keep our free rides for senior shuttle on the road five days a week, taking our older adults to doctor's appointments, grocery stores to get their hair cut. And then we have a block party, so mark your calendars for May 13th. Uh, we will be at St. Paul's United Methodist Church in the parking lot, just having a good day celebrating together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. Next one up, as we think about the North Hills and the involvement that's there, is one that's very intimately connected to North Hills Community Outreach, and they've had a shared partnership over the years. I'm gonna invite Mark Heimbachel to come on up, who is the new Executive Director of Anchor Point Ministries, which uh, has been around for 56 years. And uh, we expect you to be able to do that since Ron just finished 35. I'll try my best. Yeah, yeah it'd be great. <laughs> I'll have the cane for you yes, when you come I'll, back I'll, in your 56th year. I'll try my best. Year. <laughs> Hopefully I'll still be alive then. <laughs> um, I'm Mark Heinbachel. I'm the Executive Director of Anchor Point Counseling Ministry, and I've actually been with Anchor Point since 2017. I worked alongside Ron uh, for the past several years, and um, it's a real honor and privilege to be able to take the helm and to be able to lead this mission forward. I'm a community member myself, and it just feels so good to be able to serve those who live around me. Um, with the nature of our services in the North Hills, um, we serve all ages, all faiths, all backgrounds, all economic levels uh, through mental health and educational services. Um, you may have seen it in the news that mental health issues right now are on the rise, especially among youth, parents, families, uh, even older adults, and we are serving all of those needs. Um, had a call the other day that I received. Uh, it was a, a man who just lost his mom, and uh, he was calling to inform me that his mother had actually left Anchor Point in her will as a designation. And it was a really cool call to receive because the family had benefited from our services back in the 1980s. And we see that time and time again that so many of our supporters have utilized our services directly. Right now in Hampton Township, we're, we've served 40 families um, in the past year uh, dealing with mental health issues, going through the counseling process, and um, eight of those families needed to rely on our sliding scale, so they were not able to afford the services they needed, and because Anchor Point was here, it was the only way they could get those services. So thank you so much to Hampton and for your support over the years. We are just so very grateful. If you're looking for an additional way to help. Um, we have a Lenten giving event that's going on right now. Um, small gifts, every small gift we receive of $10 or more, um, for every five of those gifts, we get a $500 matching gift from an anonymous funder. Um, and then we also have, if you're able and willing to sign up for monthly giving, the same thing. If you sign up, a $500 matching gift goes directly to Anchor Point during this time. Thank you so much again. Really appreciate it and great to be here. You know it, Mark. Always good being able to work with you. And uh, as we recognize our connection one to another in this community, and some of us have deep roots within this area, and we know people and we have that kind of affiliation, there are individuals who find themselves on the run, frightened, scared, vulnerable, have to leave their home and even their country. I don't know, none of us, fortunately, have had to be in that circumstance uh, where you have been the fear of your life. Fortunately, God works in people's lives to be able to rise to the occasion. And one of those persons that we have here that we support is Dave and Lori Gretzinger. So Dave, come on up and share with us a little bit about what's going on within the Steps of Boaz, which is an absolutely phenomenal ministry. 
Well, good morning. As I mentioned earlier this morning, it always feels like home coming back to the Hampton family. As Pastor Ted mentioned, we work with small Ibantu refugees here in the city of Pittsburgh. There are about 130 families currently, and they still continue to arrive, about 1,200 people. And we serve alongside the community leadership to help them help their own people assimilate into life in America and the various needs that they have. But two months ago, we had a very profound and very sad event happen in the midst of our engagement with the community. An individual with whom I've worked, walked very closely with over the last eight years, who actually has been serving as the senior elder or senior tribal leader here in Pittsburgh of the small Ibantic community. His name is Hamadi Matula. Last summer, traveled back to Africa to visit some of his family back in the refugee camps, as well as scattered in other locations. And while he was there, he grew very sick. And Hamadi, by the way, is almost the same age as me from some of his records. He is 50. We think he's actually a little bit older than that. But he was on the verge of death. His family was able to get him some treatment in Africa, enough to get him on a plane and return him to the U.S. Last fall, he came back. He went immediately into the hospital and started to recover. However, very quickly, towards the end of November, he declined very rapidly. And in early December, Hamadi passed away, a close friend of mine who had journeyed with for a very long time. And we were honored to be invited to his funeral services. As a Muslim, the funeral itself took place as prayers in the mosque, and then shortly thereafter, they transported him to the graveyard. And because of his religious and cultural traditions, the burial process for Hamadi does not look like what we're accustomed to, but rather they bury bodies outside of the coffin in the dirt. And so when we arrived at the graveyard, there was a group of men directly surrounding the hole in the ground and a group of women shortly thereafter. And the women were wailing at the top of their lungs, crying for this man who had passed from their community. And I was ushered close to the grave, and they were digging it out by hand. And they were slowly disassembling Hamadi's coffin to be able to bury him. And as the proceedings went forward, they asked me and several others that were with our team, we were the only ones there that were non-Somali Bantu. They invited us forward because of our friendship with Hamadi to join in burying our friend. And so they had me bend down and pick up a handful of dirt, and I buried my friend with tears streaming down my face. And as I was doing that, I was carried away in my heart and mind to a story that maybe we're all acquainted with from Scripture, a story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 16. And I'm not going to tell the whole story, but I just want to pick up in verse 23. And it's about Lazarus and the rich man. It says this, in Hades, the rich man lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I, I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that sharing, during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. And the rich man said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not come to this place of torment. And I I stood there burying my friend Hamadi. I realized that although we had had the chance to demonstrate the love of Jesus to him, because of language barriers, he had only had glimpses of the good news of Jesus who we follow. And so I realized that as I was burying him with soil, this was the fine moment that I would stand before him and I would not share eternity with him. For there was a great chasm fixed between us. And as this story reflected on my heart, I realized and imagined in my mind that there was Hamadi calling out to us saying, tell my family, tell my community, tell my brothers that they would not be in the same torment as I am. And so this for us is in the steps of Boaz become our war cry. That there would be no more Hamadis. It is the reason why we do what we do. 
And as they are our neighbors here in Pittsburgh, if God is stirring your heart to reach out to those that have fled from their homeland, as Pastor Ted said, and God has brought them here to be in a place where they can hear the good news about Jesus, please stop by and talk to me. There's many ways that you can be involved. But we also thank you for your support and for your prayers because it's only because of you that we can walk alongside of those like Amadi to share the good news of Jesus. Thank you so much, Dave. And our prayers are with you. There's a, there's a grief that we experience, and sometimes that grief becomes far heavier than we ever knew when we say goodbye to a friend. Hmm. You know, there's a situation <clears throat> that happened 33 years ago when a dear friend was commissioned by his church to go and deliver a turkey to a lady who felt like the world had just abandoned her. Bottom dropped out. Things were bad. So this friend of mine goes, delivers a turkey. Let's that turkey goes to the lady and says, here, we want to give this to you from the church and Merry Christmas, God's blessings to you. And he turned around and left and he thought, what did I just do? This woman needs more than a turkey. She needs her house repaired. She needs somebody to come and hear the cry of Hosanna, Lord save us, because that's what many people cry out in the midst of their destitution. And so, <clears throat> 33 years ago, Don Ed responded to a, a call from God, even in his dream, to make sure that the trucks were all painted a certain color. And on Palm Sunday in 1990, Hosanna Industries was born. And on that same day, well, close to it, they came knocking on Hampton's door and said, we need money. <laughs> and so Becky Hetzer comes to be able to tell us a little bit about what's going on with Hosanna Industries. <laughs> and just thank you, Hampton, for so many years of support, really. You know, every from $10 to 10000 every single dollar is connected to a person and it's connected to a congregation. And we just sincerely thank you uh, for all these years of support and then through volunteerism. So for those of you who don't know about Hosanna completely is, our main focus is to repair homes for needy families, just as the original story and, and why we were born, um, to show God's love um, through very practical purposes and, and ways. So swinging a hammer, um, you know, putting some shingles down, uh, we do all sorts of home repairs, hot water tanks and new windows and handicapped wheelchair ramps um, and, and everything in between. And we do this uh, with God's love and his fire in our belly uh, and within us. Uh, the spirit of the Lord leads us each and every day. And we're just, um, we're trying to spread his love again in a very practical way. So you can uh, see me afterwards if you're ever interested in doing that, um, you know, to volunteer. We don't have volunteers every single day, but there are definitely moments and times when it's appropriate to come out and really um, be the hands and the feet of the Lord. Um, you know, what, what Hosanna does is repairs homes, but we also, and more importantly, uh, we repair hearts because we're bringing um, a practicality and to, the, to the world and to the people who need it most and with a really, really big heart. I think that's what uh, separates Hosanna from so many others from when the call first comes in that says, I need help. You know, I need a new roof. Um, and I'm only making $10,000, $12,000 a year, <laughs> not a month. Um, and I can't afford to put a new roof on. I can't afford a hot water tank. Um, I really need a wheelchair ramp so I can get out of my home. Um, these, are, these are the kind of stories that we hear. Uh, these are people who are in desperate need and uh, really have nowhere else to turn. So it's wonderful that uh, you continue to support a mission that is really uh, just providing such a great need that's in the community. Our waiting list is well over a year long. You finish one project, two more calls come in. Um, the need is out there. And as we know how the pandemic has just changed the world, really, <laughs> completely, um, you know, there is more need now uh, than ever. So thank you again for your support. Uh, continue to pray for us, and we're just very grateful for you. Thanks so much, Peg. You know, there's a cool thing that happens in the city of Pittsburgh because people find themselves in a destitute place, or maybe they purposely said, I'm done. Most of the time, these folks find themselves thinking they can't live in the home where they were 
and they find themselves on the street. And this is a real trauma. But fortunately, there's folks like Michael Moore who run Northside Common Ministries and make sure that this thing happens and that these men and even some of the ladies, I would imagine, that can come through there are being addressed. Come on up, Michael. And it's great to have you. He is brand new in holding the reins of this marvelous ministry after years and years and years of it being uh, led so well. And welcome to Hampton Church. It's my pleasure to welcome you here. It's my first time to be able to meet you. So, yeah, nice to good you. to have you here. Well, I just want to first and foremost thank the congregation and all your years of support. Um, I had the pleasure of working under uh, Jay, who most of you guys are probably familiar with. Very big shoes to fill. <laughs> um, a little bit about our mission is, uh, as he said, we uh, serve um, the homeless population, um, mostly male identifying um, just people struggling with mental health, uh, drug addiction, um, I mean, simple as a, a domestic breakup, um, you name it, we're, we handle all that. Um, this mission is very um, dear to me because as a, young, as a young person, I grew up in LA on the streets of Skid Row, so I understand homelessness, come from a family of addiction. So a lot of times in life, it's not where um, we want to be, it's where God puts you. So that's something that I'm learning and being humble to in my mission is, you know, hey, God, you take control. You tell me how to work with the, the gentleman and use my life experiences as, as a testimony and with your support and um, the support of our, uh, of our extended community, we've been able to do that. Some of our services are um, employment services. We have caseworkers. We're also in the process with me transitioning into this role of training our RAs to do casework, more intensive services with the guys instead of just being an oversight. So they're really working and building goals and trying to build that stability opposed to just putting a Band-Aid on and saying, hey, you're here for you know, 120 days, get a job and get out. We really want to see what the barriers are. So we're really working to really penetrate that. I have a great assistant director who worked with us previously, but I brought him back. <laughs> so he's been, uh, he, he's been a godsend. And um, just a lot of transition, a lot of good programs we're really trying to get out there. We also have a GD program. Um, we also have... Um, um, uh, employment programs through Goodwill, which is like job training, so that helps a lot. And we're connected with Allegheny Link, who actually has um, a program that uh, connects guys to housing, and they will pay for the housing up to two years to allow them for more stability. We're also using this horn reduction model, which is no matter what the barrier, we still have to take them. A lot of shelters won't take them if they're still dealing with uh, their circumstances, but we will. We'll take anybody and just work where they are. Just like Jesus met people in the street, we're trying to meet people where they are. So that's pretty much Northside Common Ministry, so thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. <laughs> we look forward to being able to hang with you sometime. <laughs> Welcome to the city, too. Christ 
wise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. truth. You may be seated, my friends. Got a scripture reading this morning coming from one of our minor prophets, Zechariah. And what you'll hear here is how the Jews, as they were in relationship with the people around them, affected them. So let us now listen to these words from Zechariah chapter 8, verse 20 through 23. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Many peoples and the inhabitants of many cities will yet come, and the inhabitants of one city will go to another and say, Let us go at once to entreat the Lord and to seek the Lord Almighty. I myself am going. And many peoples and powerful nations will come to Jerusalem to seek the Lord Almighty and to entreat him. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days... Ten men from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, Let us go with you, because we have heard that God is with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, the fun thing that we have here at the church are six standing committees that operate under the rule of the session. And one of those committees is the mission committee, and you are about to be exposed to one of the greatest guys in this congregation, Mr. Jim Janofsky. Bring it on down, Jim. <laughs> now, I can't speak after that. But <laughs> uh, first off, I want to thank all the missionaries who are here with us today. Uh, they do a tremendous job, uh, and to put in plugs for them, uh, I know we all have very busy schedules. But there are times when you have a day here or a day there. Uh, Becky, who is in Hosanna, um, and they do builds. Every once in a while, they need extra people, and it's probably just for a day. Uh, and if you can get away for a day, it's well worthwhile. Uh, Pleasant Valley Men's Shelter, Michael over here. Uh, our church does a dinner uh, one Saturday every month uh, and to feed 25, 27 gentlemen who are more than appreciative of it. Uh, it sounds like a lot of people to feed, but I'll tell you, uh, you know, we've done it in the past and you can get a couple families and do it and it doesn't take much. Uh, it, it takes a little bit, bit of time out of your day and effort, but uh, you go down there and the thanks you get is tremendous. Um, we serve, I think, 22 um, different entities, uh, about half here in the United States and half globally. Uh, the global ones are just truly amazing. Uh, you know, we live in a great country here. We have problems, but 
we have things here that you don't have in other countries. I mean, Dave's group who came from Somalia, uh, you know, the people who came from there came through tragedy. Um, there are two that I can think of immediately, and all of them have something going on, but uh, we have a missionary in Afghanistan who has served uh, youth and deaf kids uh, in a very poor section of town. Uh, due to the Taliban, she's cur currently in exile. Um, one, one you'll hear up here later, or maybe not because it's very soft. <laughs> the India is the largest democratic country in the world. Um, imagine that when the prime minister was running for his current position, one of the things he ran on was getting rid of Muslims and Christians in the country, and that's his goal. How awful could that be? Um, so, you know, we've got nine people on mission committee. Uh, we now have the pleasure of having Graham Waybright. Uh, so we have a little bit, because all the rest of us are oldies, but it's great to have Graham on board so we get a youthful perspective there. Um, I'm also sitting in for two people today. Um, Be Betsy Lanyard, who runs uh, Hampton uh, Preschool. Um, she wanted me to mentioned to you, and I'm sure a lot of you have had some kind of relationship with Hampton Preschool, but Hampton Preschool has brought a lot of people into this church, and the services they do are tremendous. Uh, but she said the, the goal is to support families in the community by offering a wonderful preschool experience that focuses on the whole child. Now, we as uh, the mission committee do some support. We'd like to do more for the preschool. Uh, they have, um, what do you call it, uh, scholarships, yes, sir. thank you, I was looking for the word, uh, scholarships, because there are some kids who can't go to preschool without a scholarship, and we support that, uh, we'd like to do more with that. Uh, this, during COVID, I think they were running somewhere around 130 to 150 students, uh, the other day we had a meeting and uh, there are 195 uh, signed up for next year, which is super. Um, the teachers there don't do it for the money. They do it for the love. So something great that supports us, but we support them as well. Uh, the other one that uh, could not attend because he just got COVID, uh, World Mission Initiatives, it's actually part of the Pitch Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Bala who was supposed to come today. Uh, he works with a guy by the name of Hunter Farrell. But this really started uh, mostly because of Don Dawson. Um, Don uh, structured a group there. They go to a seminary. He wanted them to uh, have touch with the rest of the world. And I think it's now a requirement there uh, that they go on a mission trip and go to different countries. This last year they went to Lebanon, someplace in um, Eastern Europe and a couple of other places. But part of the thing they have to do is learn about other countries and what people are going through. So uh, that's a tremendous mission. We help support them as well. Uh, I'd like to call Gene Cushon up here if he's around. Uh, one of the things we do is an annual uh, adult mission trip. It's normally sometime in October to coincide with Ted's birthday because we always have a big birthday celebration. Uh, so that would mean um, going probably, I think, the week of October 15th this year. But we go, we have fun. Uh, we have people who go on that trip, me in particular, who maybe knows how to swing a hammer and screws things in, but I have people like Gene and Ted and others who show me what to do, but I'm gonna let Gene will talk about it a little bit. Thanks, Jimmy. I said this, I gave a speech uh, a bunch of years ago about the mission trips, and the one thing that always sticks in my mind is what we did this year. We went to Kentucky where tornadoes came through. The torna tornado tornadoes were so bad that it actually lifted a train off the tracks and took it 100 yards into a hillside. Um, so what I said about 10 years ago, I'm going to say it again. 
imagine you go to church and a tornado comes through and your house is gone. I mean gone. There's nothing. There's a foundation. You have no personal effects left. You have nothing. That's what happened in Kentucky. That's what happened to a, a, in Joplin, Missouri when we went there. Uh, tornadoes are, I mean, all, our, all the natural disasters are, are terrible, but uh, just put that in your head. You know, you, you have no home left. You have nothing. You have no photos. You have nothing. Uh, we go to these mission trips sometimes under Hosanna, Sim Samaritan's Purse. Sometimes we just wing it. Um, but we, we, uh, we accomplish a lot in the week that we spend there. And if you can see it in your heart to put a few days aside, maybe a vacation days or whatever, please do it. it it's like uh, Jim said, it's in October. It's usually a nice time of the year. Yeah, we have to bow down to Teddy because it's his birthday week. But we do have fun. We have a lot of accomplishments. And it's very satisfying when we leave the place and you look back and you say, wow, we did this, we did that. And we also, our, our main goal is to communicate uh, to the people that we are dealing with uh, the, the love of God. Uh, last year we went to Madisonville, Kentucky, and in a week's time, we put in a floor, we put in the interior and exterior fr framing and the roofing in one week with, how many people do we have? Probably less than 10. We had eight. Eight, eight. Uh, so we worked hard, we had a lot of good fun, uh, but it's really worthwhile and I'm the guy that, you know, show me where to swing the hammer and that's about it. Gene, knows, Gene and Ted know what to do, so thank you. We now have time in our service where we can think about some of the stories that we've heard, and we still have a few more that we're going to hear on how God is working around us. We can realize the blessings that we have, and hopefully as you've been hearing these stories, God's been tapping on your heart and how he can use your time, your talent, and your treasure to support these ministries. And so let's have a prayer for the offering, and then we'll take it. It's our heads. Good and gracious God, thank you for all that you do. God, as we think about what we have and we give back, we ask that you would use us, that you would use our time, our talent, and our treasure so that people in this community and communities around the world would come to know of the love that you have for them and that their lives might be transformed. We pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. needs you strong but life hits you out of nowhere and barely leaves you holding on and when you're tired of fighting chained by your control there's freedom in surrender lay it down and let it go so when you're on your knees and answer seems so far away you're not alone, stop holding on and just be held. Your world's not falling apart, it's falling into place. I'm on the throne, stop holding on and just be held. Just be are on the storm, you wonder if I love you still, but if your eyes are on the cross, you know I always have and I always will, and not a tear is wasted, in time you'll understand, I'm painting beauty with the ashes, and life is in my hands. When you're on your knees and answer seems so far away You're not alone, stop holding on and just be held Your world's not falling apart, it's falling into place I'm on 
on the throne stop holding on and just be held just be Thank you so much, Ben. It's a beautiful affirmation for us that when we're in those tight spots, we just want to be held. And sure enough, we just got done last week with an amazing conference that took place that we support. And one of our mission partners who's here with us, recognizing that there are some students who go off into these foreign places called university or college, and their lives are turned upside down, and they just want to be held held in a way that says, wait a minute, I have value. So, Jim Burkhauer, come on up here. Tell us a little bit about how that gets communicated as you transform students to transform the world. Yeah. So, I work with the CCO, and um, we host the Jubilee Conference. Um, that happened last weekend in Pittsburgh. So, that hasn't happened in person in a couple years. So, we were really excited to have a couple thousand students there in person again, communicating the, the story of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration, and calling students to find their their value and their worth and, and being created in the image of God, as well as finding their purpose and um, how God has called them to live that out in the world. So um, I'm going to tell a little story, and um, we'll have a little video here in a minute with Allie. Allie was a student at Point Park University, and she um, really caught a vision for serving God with her life during college. And she actually came on staff with us and served in the events department helping to put on Jubilee for a few years, and that's how she used her gifts. And then as she continued in her own faith and her own sense of calling, God called her to um, work with a Celsi ministry in Guatemala, and she just went last year to a Celsi. And um, connecting that um, story um, to how God's at work in the CCO as well as Allie's life is how we also do trips. And COVID obviously made trips hard to do, especially taking students to other countries. For um, many years, we took students to Peru, and we were excited to launch a, uh, a trip with students to Peru to work with that ministry. And I forgot to mention it in the early service, but Jubilee took an offering for this ministry in Peru that we were going to take students to, but were not able to because of things going on in the country of Peru. So that um, trip got disrupted just recently, but students are signed up to go, and um, in light of that, God was working in Ali's life, and God was closing doors in Peru, but opening doors in Guatemala, where he sent Ali. So let's listen to Ali talk a minute, and then I'll follow up. CCO student alumni. I went on the first trip to Peru with the CCO, where it totally transformed my life. It gave me a heart for missions and the world and God's people on such a great, beautiful way. And now today, many years later, I am living and working in Guatemala, where I work with a ministry called Aselsi. At Aselsi, we serve the community with a medical clinic and evangelism and much more. I am so grateful for what the CCO has instilled in my life 
It influences me every day in my leadership and in my love and sharing the gospel with other people. So we're super excited about the way that God has been at work um, in Allie's story through the ministry of the CCO and how he brought her to Guatemala. And now as a result of that, we are able to bring another generation of students to actually go and serve with her in Guatemala. And if you could just pray about that trip happening this summer, um, and Allie will be able to take that trip that was going to go to Peru. They're now going to be able to go to Guatemala. And we just see another Allie raised up, another student who catches a vision for serving God with their life in the world. And so we're super excited about that. Well, one thing that has happened lately around our world is a ministry that has done faithful work in East Liberty. And they have faced a real trauma that none of us really would want to have to experience. You may have read about it in the paper or heard about it in the news. But Joe Allen Welsh does a phenomenal job of being able to bring the word to us about how this mission continues to do what it needs to do, even in the face of hardship and uh, unfortunate circumstances. Joe Allen, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, our health center is a Christian health center, and um, our mission is to witness God's love through Jesus Christ um, by empowering our patients. Um, through quality health care uh, for the uninsured, underinsured, and underserved. Um, we have approximately a little over 10,000 individual patients. Um, and of those 10,000 patients, um, we have a little over 40,000 visits per year. Um, and as Pastor Ted said, recently... Um, we have um, come into a hardship. Um, an employee, it was not theft, um, but totally mismanaged um, our finances. And um, so it, was, it really, you know, threw us for a loop um, back in August and, you know, coming to find out a lot of things that um, were done, were not done, um, and, and really put us um, in debt. Um, we unfortunately had to lay off some staff, but they were not doctors or nurses. Uh, we're still keeping the doors open and seeing our patients. And um, we were asking, definitely please, for your prayers. Um, we are putting a lot of mechanics in place to make sure that something like this never happens again. Um, and we have gotten some people in the positions that they need to be in in order to see us through to um, financial stability. Um, but like Pastor Ted said, you know, it's just, it's a rough time, and we know God is with us. Uh, we have been in the community for a little over 40 years, and um, we really don't believe that... Um, we are going to be closing our doors, um, but with God's help and your prayers, we know that we can we can carry on and and see this through and and come out in a much better place. But I also want to thank you so much. Hampton is has been such a supporter of the health center um, for such a long time, and we greatly appreciate your support um, and most of all your prayers. Thank you so much. Well, and last but certainly not least is the opportunity that's available for all of you. We've seen our international mission partners. We've heard about some of our local mission partners and the work that they're doing. And wow, you have the opportunity to blend both of those together with a phenomenal ministry that Scott Boyd is leading. And those students were just here on Ash Wednesday. So Scott, good to have you here on behalf of PRISM. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yes, it was great to be here for Ash Wednesday. We had students from... Brazil, Indonesia, Japan, Kenya, uh, Ghana, I can't remember what else. It was great. But so, sometimes missions can be done by us going to the world. Sometimes missions can be done by the world coming to us. So I don't know if you know it, but here in Pittsburgh, there are 13,000 international students that come from countries all over the world. Most of them uh, unlike refugees who are planning to stay here, are not planning to stay here, they're planning to go back home. And so they represent an opportunity to take the gospel
back home with them. Uh, I've been so impressed by hearing from all of you about the interconnectedness of all these ministries. My former uh, administrative assistant went to go work at Aselsi in Guatemala, and Micah, who you saw in the video, was on the PRISM staff for several years. Uh, the, the chairman of our board is um, also a doctor at the East Liberty Health Center. So there's just so many overlapping ministries happening here. Um, but the success stories of PRISM, I always say PRISM is not a ministry of gathering, it's a ministry of scattering. And so we, the success stories of our ministry are what happens when students go back to the far parts of the globe to do ministry where, they, where they're going. And I think of Asioli and Andrea who went to back to Sao Paulo, Brazil. They received Christ here in Pittsburgh, got established in their faith. They went back to Sao Paulo. They're helping their church run a ministry to street children in that city. I think how long would it take and how expensive would it be to send a North American missionary to do such a work? Or I think of Tiger and Tracy who returned to Shanghai and I, I talked to them. They had a house church of about 15 people. I checked with them a few years later. It was a house churches of 300 people scattered all over, all over Shanghai. And, you know, I think of this May I'll be going to uh, Colombia to visit a woman named Elizabeth who accepted Christ here. She's now the director of projects for the whole denomination of uh, the Christian Missionary Alliance denomination in Colombia. So just to see how uh, people being scattered uh, can really make a difference and impact in places where it would be hard for us to go, languages we don't speak. And, um, and, and yet, there's a way for you to be involved. You can go on a mission trip without leaving home by welcoming an international student into your home for Thanksgiving, or we have a program on our website, PGH Commission, PGH Commission called Connections. You can sign up to be a friendship partner or a mentor to an international student. Many of them are just glad to meet with someone to talk through life, process life, have a friend locally. Um, so that's uh, PGH Commission, and uh, it's called the Connections Program. You can do that. Uh, you can come to our banquet in March. We have a banquet at a Lamont restaurant um, up in Mount Washington, March 30th. There's a lunch and a dinner on the same day. That would be a great way to come here uh, more about the ministry and global apologetics guy named Stuart McAllister is going to be the speaker there and I would I would like to invite you there but most of all I just want to thank you for your investment in reaching the world for Christ whether from here in Pittsburgh or around to the far parts of the globe you're committed and we thank you we're privileged to partner with you thank so much Scott and what it's So wonderful is your unfailing love. Your cross has spoken mercy over me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart can fully know. How glorious, how beautiful you are.
His love, cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. You opened my eyes to your wonders anew, you captured my heart with His love, cause nothing on earth is as three different mission partners across the globe. And this is the work that's done because of our first fruits giving. My friends, this is a glorious church. We are doing God's work and you're doing it as you go out into the world. I mean, just by rubbing shoulders with your neighbor in the checkout line or wherever you're working, you get to radiate that love. So go in peace, my friends. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, let the people of God say, Amen. there it is. Beautiful.